They're the people we hope never to need. But when an emergency occurs, they're all we depend on. Um, it's an emergency. Tell me exactly what's happened. I'm going to tell you how to stop the bleeding, OK? Filming with 999 call takers, emergency paramedics and their patients. This is the continuing story of the men and women of the HSE National Ambulance Service. That's the bits of this job I love. Great fun. Hey, 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 hey. It's OK. It's OK. This time, what happens when the sun sets and an old crew unites to face the darkest of rescues? We've got a call to a person in the river. He's jumped into the river, he's done it for a reason, so he might not cooperate fully with us. I didn't ask for any of this. How the ambulance service copes when faced with fictitious calls for help. A hoax call is very frustrating. I don't understand. 111 is not a contact number. And how no two days are ever the same and every call can change in a heartbeat. His daughter was there and she was explaining that he has this internal defibrillator fitted. His internal device decided to kick in and gave him a shock while he was still on the chair. There's a hand there. Fergus. A hand. Give it a hand. Look activated. <laughs> what the? Okay. Myself and Imelda were back for the for the one night shift. We had one night of reconciliation after the divorce. Um, my partner was in holidays, so um, the shift had to be filled, and it ended up that Peter was actually going to be covering the shift. Right. Okay. Take two. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know I was going to be working with Peter or he didn't know he was going to be working with me until we actually came to work that night. Um, so it was funny. Uh, we were staying back together for one night only. Focus, focus. Okay. You don't need your watch anymore. It'll tell you on the screen. You can see, I hope people will see, straight away we sat back into the ambulance and we were back to the way we were initially. Are you changing cars? Yeah. What are you getting rid of? An S Max. I'm after buying it. You get rid of the Skoda? Yeah. A new West Max, sir? No, it's. <laughs> I'm a public servant. <laughs> I'm a S Max. We just really connect. We're in contact with each other, as I said, outside the job. Like, she tells me how her smallies getting on, I tell her how my smallies are getting on. My child has decided he turns into a monster. Mm -hmm. So everything will be lovely, calm, normal, and the next day he'll just start screaming. And you're like, what's wrong with you? I'm a monster. Yeah. That was fine until he chased kids in the playground up in Wicklow last week. <laughs> <laughs> the older sibling was fine, but the younger one, I think, got frightened, and she ran, and he ran after her, and she ran, she ran out of the playground, and he ran out of the playground after, and then she started crying. <laughs> we have such a good connection. Yeah, we, we really do. Um, it doesn't matter. I'd say if we were five years, if we hadn't worked together for five years and we sat back into an ambulance, I'd say it would be the exact same thing as if we had left each other the day before. All I can say is the driving's improved. It <laughs> 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 hmm. was like never being apart, I suppose, just slotted back together working, carried on with the calls, didn't even discuss them, just got on with it again. Which was, um, it was gas after being apart, I suppose, for so long. Busy enough, isn't it? Is, yeah. To be fair, it's Friday night. Yeah. I like being busy on nights. I hate being quiet on nights. It's one thing that wrecks my head. If we're anyway quiet on nights, it drives me around a twist. I'm, I'm kind of a fidgety guy anyway, and I like to be tipping away doing something the whole time. But if you're quiet on nights, the night tends to drag on like there's no end to it. I much prefer to go from call to call to call to call. The night passes much faster. 999 mode activated. The man in the Motion river droning. Underwater droning. Where? Anderson's key. We got a call to a person in the river, so we responded. Look at the fireies there as well. Yeah. Guards as well, probably. Instant location, approximate. We were down there as well the other night for one. Yeah? Yeah. 
usually we find that when we get calls to people in the river, when we get there, the fire brigade are usually there initially, and the guards, because the fire brigade seem to get the initial call for somebody in the river. Hopefully, it's just for me now, it actually yeah. isn't a drone in like. I don't see any blue lights there. They know they're going to be spotted an awful lot of the time. The spot where it happened is, is a busy spot, you know, so people's motives, sometimes you'd question as to people's motives. I'll take my AP bag, I suppose. We're out of the way. Yeah, I'll go and call it up, call it up, block the road. Yeah. Uh, okay, they're bringing the basket down. So we arrived on down. The fire service here is based in the city centre. We're just outside the city centre, so we partly guessed the fire service would be on scene quite quickly. When we got there, the gentleman was in the water. He did have a life by about around him, and the fire brigade were just about to lower um, a crew into the water to retrieve the gentleman out of the water. My next kind of fear, I suppose, especially for the fire lads in the river, is how cooperative is this guy going to be? You know, but they're very well trained, even if they're not cooperative of getting these guys out of the river. So they sent down their basket on one of the cranes they have at the back of the fire tenders and got the chap up. There's nothing we can do when they're in the water. We can get our equipment ready for when he comes up out of the water. Um, which we did. What we did was got our stretcher ready, got extra blankets ready and a foil blanket just to keep him warm. We turned the heating on the ambulance on the way down just to be sure that the ambulance is nice and warm and he gets into it. The thing is full of water so we'll stand him out onto it? Yeah, yeah. Here stand he him out, shirt off, hands yeah. down, down on and away yeah. we go. Happy? Myself and Amelda, we started to formulate a plan between the two of us as to what we'd do once the chap came out of the river. Once we know it's not going to be a resuscitation and that he's probably not injured, that it's probably just a case of he's going to be wet, cold and maybe uncooperative with us because if he's jumped into the river, he's done it for a reason, so he might not cooperate fully with us. So just we formulate a plan as to around what we're going to do with the chap. We'll just leave him in the basket. What? Take everything off in the basket, the go on them and then stand yeah. them up then. And then you have to judge how the person is going to react when they come out of the water. We're just going to get the clothes off, yeah? No, we're just going to get the clothes off before we even take them out of the basket if we can. Just stay in the basket. All right, and we'll wrap you up in blankets. First thing is we'll strip them, get the wet clothes away from them and start to warm them up, wrap them up in blankets, get them dry, get them warm and then we can start dealing with the issue as to why, why, what's gone on surrounding the fact that they've ended up in the river. Come here. That's more challenging than warming up somebody. A lot of the times when people are got into the water, they've done it on purpose, and especially from where he was, it wasn't that you were just going to fall into the water, there wasn't any openings or anything, so he obviously had intentionally done this. Um, sometimes they don't want to be saved, I didn't ask for any of this. When he came up out of the water, his initial thing was, who called you? I didn't ask for you. I don't want your help. So you kind of have to kind of persuade them to come into the ambulance, have a chat with us, you know, get the clothes. They're all wet. You know, you're going to get very cold. It's night time. And you start with just even simple things like that. Come here, we're here to mind you. Come on, sit up in the bed. Sit up in the bed. Come on. I know, I know. Yeah. I wasn't going to do it anyway. I'm I may have to swim. Okay. I only wanted to swim across the road. Got him onto the stretcher. Initially, he was quite uncooperative. We're trying to help you. We're trying to get you warm. Again, using kind of distraction and things like that. We got him into the ambulance, uh, stripped him down. Can we get off the wet clothes? All right. You said you were frozen. Mum, we help you. While the clothes stay on. You're going you're to, you're going to, to feel worse, all right? He was still quite cross that he'd been brought out of the water. And then he was telling us at the same time that he just went, went to go in for a swim and that he was going to swim over to the other side and he was going to get out himself. And with the next breath then, he was telling us that he'd be better off dead and his family would be better off without him. So he was very mixed up. He didn't really know what he wanted. So That's it. Shirt to fit. Yeah. OK. I'll just throw it down there for no. a minute. It must be frozen, yeah? got one of the hospital gowns on him and started to warm him up and then had a chat with him as to what had happened that he went into the river. Oh, oh, oh. Sit, sit up in the blanket. Oh, what the f***? Sit up. No. 
Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. He could get very volatile, very fast. So it was just a case of reacting and just trying to change conversation and just keeping him calm. All right. Most people, if you chat to them, you know, anyway, kind of reasonably, and you know, you know, they know you're there to help them, and you're not there to cause any hassle. They'll just, they'll just cooperate with you most of the time. Hi, Roger, we've left the scene there on route to the Mercy Hospital. Brought him along as far as um, one of the local A and E units, and they had a word with him as to what went on. Um, and just made sure like he had no injuries or anything, so we weren't concerned for him in that sense. And once he was warm again, he was fine. It was just a case of deal with whatever issues he had surrounding jumping in. In the end, he was thankful, um, and he, he thanked us both, um, even though initially he wanted nothing to do with us. Mm -hmm. So it's all just talking to the person and trying to understand what's going on with them, if they'll, if they'll share the, that with you. Hoax calls are... I don't understand them. A hoax call is very frustrating. You might have a child. Sometimes it can be an adult. A child, you can nearly understand. You can say, look, this is wrong. You should not be calling the emergency services. You do realise we're trying to help people and you're holding up an emergency services line. I've seen... I've seen hoax calls from just somebody you know, ringing up and saying something stupid and hanging up to somebody getting everything from fire, ambulance, guards, stopping railways, uh, railways from running, um, all in, all in one go. If you get sometimes an adult hoax calling, it, it's even worse. You're saying to them, you should be intelligent enough, no, not to do that. As call takers. You start to become attuned to hoax calls. Ammon's emergency. So a hoax call that I got one night when I was on shift was, for all intents and purposes, it sounded like a child on the other end of the phone. OK, where's your mum or dad? At work, OK. Do you know your mum's contact number? We asked how old was he. He said he was 13 in the toothpaste factory, and where does your dad work? Caller told me that his parents worked in the toothpaste factory. Now, given the area of where the call had happened, I knew there was no toothpaste factory. So I said to him, can you give me a contact number for your mum or dad? Are you in the house on your own? If he's 13 years of age, he's in the house on his own, he's a minor, we need to get somebody there, be it the guardie or be his mum and dad, to make sure he's okay. 111 is not a contact number. He said to me that his mum's mobile number was 111. Next thing I said, that's not correct. That's not a legitimate number. He said, it's 222. Listen to me, I know you're upset, OK? But I need to know where you are if you want me to get the guardie or an ambulance to you, OK? I said to my colleague, can you get the guardie for me? We tried to establish exactly, was it a hoax call? Was it a legitimate call? Can you go and find your neighbour for me? Why don't you have any neighbours? He couldn't give us an exact address. We got the town, we got the county, and we got a basic area. He was trying to tell us he was across the road from a house with a brown door, he was down the street from this shop, but none of it made any sense. So your friend died because your cousin went to the shop and a burglar came and chopped his legs off? He said that he was barricaded in the house, that his friend's legs had been cut off, 
that somebody had kidnapped his friend and taken him on the bus to Dublin. This is an emergency line, okay, so you need to be honest with me because you're holding up an emergency line for other people that need help, okay? Eventually I had to say to him, you're wasting emergency services time. You need to stop this, you know, you are hoax calling us, etc, etc. My random hoax caller from the middle of nowhere. Why do I get the hoax callers? Parents in the toothpaste factory was the best. So at the end of it, we passed it on to the Gardaí. We asked the Gardaí to get in contact. Turns out the Gardaí had already had a similar call from him earlier on in the day. And I arrived back in and shift the next night to find out that one of my other colleagues had actually gotten the exact same call from the same caller, exact same details. And again, he was wasting more resource time. How old are you? You're 13, okay. Do you need the guards up there in the fire brigade if you're locked in, if there's a robber there? From, from the time that ECAS started even giving you the number, the first noise or sound or something that said, your ears prick up straight away. And I don't know what it is. May, it's just like if you, the amount of calls a call taker can take, you can spot of an odd call straight away. Hey, What's your name? Are you right beside him? No. Your name's Robber. Okay. Every time you okay. take the breath At the end of the day, we can't hang up on them because we're making a presumption it's a hoax call from what evidence comes out in front of us. Are we usually right? Yeah, we usually are right. But until they either admit it or someone gets unseen, there's nobody there, you still have to treat it as, as, as a real call. Do you know that it's a very serious offence to ring for an ambulance when you don't need one? Me personally, sometimes, depending on, on the person I'm talking to, I'll, I'll try and reason with them. Maybe, maybe they've just not thought this through. And, and try and show them, well, this is what you're causing by doing this. Just think before you do something like this, because you could put somebody else's life in danger, all right? But if you ever do need an ambulance, there's no problem, just ring 999 and ask for this, okay? We are still there as a 999 service to, to help people. And, uh, you know, this person, I wouldn't ever want this person to think that because they've done something stupid before that they feel that then in a real situation, they may not be able to call us back because they might, we might remember them or they might, you, you, know, you know, something like that, especially child callers. I'm going to send the ambulance back to the base, all right? OK, thank you, bye-bye. You're literally, you're literally playing with people's lives when you make a hoax call to the emergency services because while we're dealing with whatever you tell us is going on, we can't be available to deal with somebody who's actually genuinely in need of us. Unfortunately, it's something that happens too often. Last call of the night on Saturday night, Sunday morning, I think it was about quarter past six, ten past six, we got a call that there was a 17-year-old with a gunshot wound in a field. Ambulance control is evening. Just wondering if you have any update there, Aoife, the guard you arrived on scene yet. Based on the information that we received, which was that the patient was a pitch width away from a certain landmark in the city, um, we were able to kind of pinpoint to where they might be. Come on, let me out there a minute. We stop still. Caution. Cab door open. How's it going? Good morning. Got to the scene. Guards were there before us. Um, they were after having a quick look around of the area that was given in the call, and they hadn't found anyone. Roger, we're here with the guards. Um, they've walked around all the pitches. Um, they're still having a look around, but we can't see anyone. We did a good look around. The, it sounded like a hoax, to be honest with you, um, from the information that we received. Oh, well. After a good, maybe, 20 minutes scouring the area, the guards were happy there was nothing there. We were happy there was nothing there. We got back to control and told them, you know, we can't find anything here. Right then, we are clear and available. <laughs> as we were leaving the scene, control came back to us again as the call taker had felt that it was a very genuine call. He said that his only impression of the call was that the patient had difficulty breathing following a TSW and that he feels there may actually still be a patient in the area. Um, he advised that he's returning to scene to have a second look there over. Well, we're still at scene. Um, we can have another look, certainly. There's no problem there. We asked them to check the call details again just to make sure that we were 
right with the call details and as you were listening to the, the details they were very specific from someone that was after being injured. Caller said that someone got out of a silver car and shot him. He was struggling to breathe throughout the call, kept asking why they shot him. When we started to think about it, where he said he was, was in a field, in off the road. So it would have meant that he'd have been shot very near the road, would have had to make his way into a really obscure place, out of view, uh, the call taker tried to call him back and his battery had died. So it was either hoax or he was the most unlucky person. Roger, you might get the guards back up to us as well, so please, um, it's a big enough area. We'll try and get them back up as well to help us search. I think if it was me, all I'd want is tell them where I am, come help me. I certainly wouldn't be telling them the colour of the car that it pulled up or that someone had shot me from a footpath. You wouldn't make it all the way up here if you got shot in the chest down there. And if you were down there, we'd have passed him. Like, you can just see the sign, OK? Let's keep the sign in our view. We're not going to get out of a car and run all the way up here. So we went back and had another look, went back around the same area again, thought about all the information that we had, put our heads together with guards and thought, you know, is there anywhere else that they could be? Are we missing anything here? Is there somewhere else that they could be that we're just not getting? But no, we all agreed, you know, based on the information that we have, this is where they need to be. It doesn't make sense. It's never in the green area down across the way which you'd get from the road. We'd still be at the roadside, though. It's approximately a pitch with the way he can see the sign. So it would have to be down here somewhere. But someone got out of a silver car and shot him. So he had to have been on a roadside. It doesn't add up. Between the time the call came in, the time we left the scene, where the call was supposed to be, it was about an hour and 20 minutes. So this was in the same shift that we'd had the guy who was sitting on the ground and wouldn't get up. So all in all, that's the best part of three hours out of a 12-hour shift that we'd now spent either trying to treat somebody who didn't, who wouldn't talk to us or looking for somebody that didn't exist. So I suppose it was kind of a waste of our time up there if it was a hoax call, which it obviously was. Again, another perfect example of a waste of time when you've got someone up in Mayfield only over there looking for an actual ambulance for a good reason, you know. We'd had another call that we could have gone to after we left the scene the first time. Now we had a patient not too far away, who we couldn't go to because we had to go back and check just to make sure that there hadn't been this young lad shot somewhere. You know, and it's just, I don't think people think their actions through, I don't know, it's the early hours of a Sunday morning. Were they after too much to drink or were they under the influence of some kind of a substance? And, you know, you have to wonder about people's psyche that they, that they think it's okay to do this. So this is another half an hour gone now. Could have been a genuine call, someone who actually needs us. Don't waste services that could be required by somebody else that could, in actual fact, save a life. Think about it before you do it. It's beyond me what, what, why people do it. I just, I can't, I can't understand it. Nobody benefits from it. Absolutely nobody. It's very hard to deal with miscarriage calls. Um, the lady doesn't want to believe that that's what's happening to her. She just re she thinks that she's spotting or that something minor might be wrong. Um, and when they ring in, we have to find out if it's a pregnancy call, and inevitably it is. And then we have to find out if they're going term or if it's a possible miscarriage. Um, if it's a possible miscarriage, there really isn't a lot that we can do for the patient. Talk to them, be there for them while they're waiting on help to arrive. Ambulance emergency. I remember that call as clear as day. Thank you, ECAS. Now, caller, what is the address of the emergency? I got a call um, from a, a young lady who said she was getting stomach pain. Um, so initially I was thinking, OK, she's got abdo pain, and I was going to go with abdo pain until she mentioned that she was three months pregnant. And pregnancy is a priority, so I went with my protocol and went with the pregnancy. Now, do not try to prevent the birth and do not sit on the toilet, OK? Assume the most comfortable position and take deep breaths. 
Now I'm going to talk you through everything here, OK? Just let me know exactly what's happening with yourself. She'd left where she was and had gone walking down the street. And then as she was walking down the street, she started to feel something wasn't right. Um, she sat down on the curb on the side of the road and rang 999 and got through to myself. Now, you said there that she's pregnant and she can't get off the ground. Tell me exactly what happened or how, what, what's wrong with her. The dots started to connect. And I started to realise this, this, this could be a miscarriage. But obviously, I didn't say it to her because you don't want to panic the patient in that situation. And we're going to have to check and see if there's any bleeding there, OK? I asked her to check was she bleeding. And she was in a public place and she was too ashamed to check if she was bleeding. And if there is any way that you can check about the bleeding there, let me know, OK? It's very important. No, no, I, I understand, I understand. As much as we needed to know if she was bleeding, I could understand she was in a public place. She did not want to be seen doing that. And she would have been embarrassed by it. And I just asked her if there was any way that she could check. And, you know, every so often, are you sure you can't check for me? Can you turn around there so nobody can see and just feel the inside of your leg or something like that? And she just refused to do it. She didn't, it was like she didn't want to know what was actually happening to her at that moment in time. You're doing absolutely fantastic. We have help on the way as fast as it can to you. And there'll be somebody there that can flag down the ambulance crew whenever they see them, is there? Her partner was there, and but he was keeping an eye out for the ambulance. So in a sense, she actually was alone other than having me on the phone. Make sure he flags them down when he sees the ambulance, all right? Okay. You could clearly hear it in her voice. She knew, but she had not accepted or did not want to believe that this was actually happening to her. And I actually just felt so helpless in the sense that I couldn't give her a hug, I couldn't tell her it would be okay, because I didn't know if it was going to be okay, and I can't tell her that. Okay, I'm staying on the phone until they're right beside you, okay? Let me know when they're right beside you. That call didn't end well. The lady did end up losing, losing the child at that stage. I think she ended up being, she was 15 weeks pregnant. Are they right there with you now? OK, look at all the best and take care, all right? OK, no problem. Bye-bye. Everybody loves to get a pregnancy call, but when it's not a happy ending in the pregnancy call, it's very emotional, especially being a woman. It is, it is emotional, because you, you, you tend to connect with them on the phone, like, they're excited, they might have been trying for months, years, to get pregnant, and then they get pregnant, and they lose it. Um, and you, you're, you're there with them, and you can just completely feel their pain every step of the way. We get an awful lot of calls for um, chest pains and they come in as cardiac chest pains. Um, so needless to say, we respond to them um, at pretty much as a high priority sort of an event. It's like routine to us to do a chest pain call. You know exactly what to ask them, you know exactly what science to look out for. On arrival when we're looking at the patient, we have a good idea as to as to how they are looking, whether they're, you know, what colour they are, are they really pale, are they slightly blue, are they sweating a lot, um, and just kind of the general how well they look. We got a call for a gentleman with um, cardiac chest pain down in Bray, um, which obviously isn't too far away from us here. Three or four. When we got there, he didn't look, he didn't look great. Yeah. Have you any problem with your breathing, Thomas? No, I'm not at the moment. Are you on blood thinners as well? Yeah, He was very pale, very clammy, had all the signs of um, a, an MI. Tom, we want to put a few more extra stickers on you. They're going to wrap around your left breast there, OK? 
to have a good, decent picture of what's going on, all right? Like he was quite well, he still had that chest pain and still kind of didn't, felt a bit uneasy about the whole thing, um, which obviously straight away for us, you know, um, sets off the little alarm bells that, would, you know, we need to get moving um, on this guy and, and see what's actually happening. Yeah. So you, you were just doing the washing up well, there? I just had washed up, dried on, I was just yeah. wiping down the seat, the hot yeah. of the seat, and you know, that place. And you felt it? Yeah. And basically told us the story that he'd been just up that morning, perfectly fine, um, just in while washing the dishes, that he got, you know, kind of a sudden, tight chest pain and luckily enough um, he had the wherewithal to just stop what he was doing and sit down. Now Tom, that's an aspirin there. You can move now. Really? It's popped in two. Take that into your mouth and give it a chew for me, alright? Two one at one. Yeah, the two of them. The two of them work with. If we are considering that it is a cardiac chest pain, we will obviously give the patient a 300 milligram tablet of aspirin and ask them to chew it. The aspirin is kind of like a, a clot buster, um, for want of a better word, so that if somebody is having a heart attack, it kind of helps stop any further um, clot from forming that may, may be causing the, the symptoms of the, the heart attack and the chest pain. And is it going into your back as well then, is it? Well, that's what it's doing. Yeah. There's no pain in your tummy at all, no? no. no. His daughter was there and she was explaining that he has this internal defibrillator fitted and the CFR was already there, the community first responder. So he had started the getting a history off her as well. If an abnormal rhythm arises in his heart, that, that device will recognise it and will shock him and hopefully convert it back to a normal rhythm. Do you mind if I put a little line into your arm in case no, we need to give you some medicine? Is that OK? Yeah. You're well used to them. Yeah. Super. I noticed from the, the ECG that he had uh, quite a fast heart rate um, and he was still quite symptomatic as well so I wasn't overly um, happy with what was going on with him um, so I did decide to cannulate that gentleman which basically means um, pop a little needle in his arm for IV access um, just in case things went a little bit downhill or if I needed to um, give him some medication through the cannula um, with regard to the, the rhythm that was on the screen but uh, unfortunately while I was doing that um, the gentleman said that he felt quite unwell or in his own words that he felt queer oh really yeah. very good I feel queer. oh you feel queer. you're okay you're okay you're okay Check stop patient. Car Car Katrina oh Push it's actually shocking him you all right Tom Luckily for him, his internal device um, decided to kick in and um, gave him a shock while he was still on the chair. Get him onto the floor. There's a hand there. Fergus, hand. give it a hand. Obviously, I alerted my colleagues on scene then as well, and we lowered him onto the floor, um, at which point his device kicked in again and gave him a second shock. Back up, back up, back up. Please. Start shocking him again. Start shocking him again. You all right? He was unresponsive for seconds. And then he just woke up. He didn't even realise what had happened. Um, you're right, Tom. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Your piece. Your your defib is after shocking you twice. It's it is. You're it is. The, uh, you're okay, the, love. You're, just down the floor. you're okay. He thought, oh, did I just fall asleep there for a second? What was that? What just happened there? So yeah, he didn't even realise. He didn't feel any pain. Didn't feel any effects from us. You're all right, Tom. Didn't feel it. You didn't feel it. Yeah. You're all right, Pat. You're okay. Need to say, while we are there, if he didn't have that, we would have obviously had to run a full cardiac arrest scenario and use the pads from our defib to revert his rhythm instead. Um, but obviously the device um, did the job for us, um, which made life an awful lot easier for us. You let me know again if you do get that funny old feeling again, all right? Mm. Or Katrina, or anybody. Okay, super. It was great to see, actually. It was great to see it working. It was great to see it in, in action, I suppose. All right. No. So keep the hands in, Tom. Yeah. Yeah. That's why it is so important, even if for, for other patients that don't have these devices in place, that CPR is started really quickly and that an AED, if there's one available in the community, is used really quickly as well to get the person back to, basically back to talking and back to a normal level. I think your internal defib did the job, Tom. You didn't feel it. I nearly felt it. <laughs> Obviously, if these things don't happen quickly, um, you know, time is muscle. Um, the, the longer things are left, the, the heart muscle starts to die or oxygen doesn't get to the brain and therefore leads to a poorer outcome for the patient. Um, so that's why it's so important to have the, all these things in place, even within your own community. He was fine, we'd done a 12 lead ECG and him after it as well, made sure he was okay and we brought him straight to Vincent's.
been a paramedic with the National Ambulance Service is one of the most amazing experiences anybody can have. And uh, I would recommend it to anybody who wanted to become a paramedic to go and do it. Best part of my job is just helping people. It's just, it might sound like a cliche, but like, do you remember that little kid that fell off the trampoline? That was a great call for me because that's what we do. People get themselves into situations, they need help, we go out and we get to help them. It doesn't necessarily, it's not all about the lights and sirens. It's not all about delivering babies. It's about going out to your ordinary Joe Soap who's had a fall or an accident or some kind of a medical condition. And by the time you leave them, be it at home or in the emergency department, they are in a better place than they were when we found them. That's what it's all about. That's the bread and butter. That's why I do it. I love it. It's fantastic feeling when you know you've made a difference. When we do get feedback as well from the crew to say that the patient is doing well, it, it's everything, like it's the reason why we all do the job, I think. Was this accidental or intentional? It's fast paced and it's good, it's very, but I get to help people, you know? You do get a lot of good stories back from people thanking you and stuff and I suppose that's what the job is about at the end of the day is looking after the people and when you get that extra thanks from them it makes the job all the worth, more worthwhile. I think the best part of the job for me would be the satisfaction of coming off the phone and no matter what the call is feeling that you've done your best for the caller and reassuring them when they're waiting for the ambulance to arrive and doing as much as we can before they get there. Yeah, they're, com they're coming as fast as they can. I'm going to tell you how to help her now while they're en route, OK? If you had a really distressed caller and someone really irate at the start of a call, and then when the ambulance arrives in the gate, they say, thank you so much, I couldn't actually have done this without you. It's just that satisfaction of knowing you've helped people. OK, no, no problem, that's fine, that's OK, no problem. OK, thank you. It's an enjoyable job. It, it can be very stressful, uh, it can be exciting, it can be boring, it can be annoying. It's a very hard job. There's days here I want to take my shirt off and fire it in the bin. But it's like, it's like once you do that, that one save, that one call, that makes it different. It just makes you like, oh yeah, I'm going to put my shirt back on tomorrow, I'm going to come in. It's the little things for me that make it all worthwhile. Uh, you can have all the equipment and all the medications under the sun, but they're just tools. They're tools to do your job, and your job is to talk to people and to interact. When you walk into a room and somebody's crying their heart out and they, they think they're on death's door, and it only takes you five minutes to say, listen, you're fine, relax, stop crying, and it all goes away. It's a great feeling. Recently, actually, we got a woman who had a stroke, and we took her to Beaumont and they basically did the thrombolectomy in her brain. And we took her out of that cat lab half an hour later, a different woman. You could see a definite change in her straight away. So there are the days where you feel really proud to do what you do because you've made such a difference. There hasn't been a day in the 14 years I'm doing it where I hated going to work. Uh, and I think that's testament to it. I have lots of friends who dread going to work for whatever job they do. Um, I, I, I've never felt like that. Ten years in, I'm still doing this job um, because I still quite enjoy it. I suppose I still, you know, I like doing the best that we can do for the patients that we go out to see. Oh, woo! I feel like we're, uh, should be down in the RDS doing a bit of show jumping. <laughs> it's always fun to come to work. I know people will slag me over saying that, but it is, it's fun. You get to meet different people on the road and different calls, and it's just always different. It's just always, always different. And you're out and about as well. You're not, you know, we get to be out on the road and seeing things, and I've seen parts of Dublin that I've never seen before in my life, and I've seen parts of Wicklow I've never seen before in my life, so yeah, it's great. When someone sees an ambulance on the road, all they see is the ambulance going to a call. But they, they don't realise what's happened in the background to do that. And I think people are now starting to maybe get the opportunity to realise that. People like to call the, the room we work in a call centre. It's not a call centre. We take calls. Yes. Uh, 
Sometimes we even manage to save lives and that's great. But, you know, we're here to help people. And what caused the fall? To ring 999, you need to be desperate. You need, you need a reason to ring 999. So to ring 999 and I get someone that is willing to help you and that is there to help you and do your best for you. That's why I do it. I do it because I want to help people. And the guys that work there in the control room, I know we have a laugh, we have a, gi a kind of giggle. You know, we don't like the soppy stuff, but you know at the end of the day, they're the best people in the world. They'll do anything for you. To be honest, it's the people. It's the people I work with, um, the fun you have with them, and it's the people you help. It makes the job so much easier, like knowing that you're coming in to have a bit of a laugh with people you consider your friends as well. <laughs> I want my own spin-off. To me, it makes it easier to come in for, let's face it, it's a long day, or night, 12 hours a long time. You got good people around you, it makes it easier. Yeah, oh, I can stop it. I was messing, I pressed buttons, that's what I, I used to be, you know, I used to do things like that for a living, so I was messing with it and I probably broke it, sorry. Why did I say we talk too much about motorbikes, do we? No, I don't know. I don't think we do either. It's a serious job and we, we know it's a serious job, but, you know, I suppose the banter is just our, our kind of coping mechanism uh, for getting through the day. Work and shift has its challenges, but it gives you a great time off to spend time with your family and your friends. I started off as a mechanic. I used to fix cars for a living. So it was a bit of a stretch from the point of view of uh, the hours that I work and the type of work that I do. But for my family to see the difference in me and the joy that I have in doing the job that I do versus coming home sort of tired and cranky and sore from a job that I don't really love doing, um, it's been an easy sort of transfer from the point of view that they see how happy I am um, and you know that's that's the key thing is that they know I'm happy and doing what I'm doing and uh, hopefully they're uh, they're proud and that I'm doing as well. You need to support your family it's we do a lot a lot of weekends bank holidays holidays Christmases Easter's you know missing tooth fairies lots of different things on on different days that you, you miss out on so you must have to support your family my smallies think it's great uh, that I'm in the ambulance they love coming into the station my little fella loves coming to the station and um, I suppose any time an ambulance passes uh, I have a little girl and she's nearly two and she'll be like daddy daddy and he, even if I'm sitting in the car, she's still saying, Daddy, she still thinks I'm in the ambulance passing. You could, have a, you could have a horrible day. You could have a hard day. You could have a bad day. But you don't want to be bringing that home. You don't want to be bringing that home, no matter how bad your day is in work, you know, with... with the worst call you've had all, you know, in your career. And you don't want to bring that home. We all do the same job. We all share the same troubles, we all deal with the same thing too as well, so you know, there's always somebody there to talk to, you know, so it's, it's good. We all have each other's back, so it's, it's good. It's a family, and that's the only way I can describe it, it's a family. Um, you spend most of your, your week working. Um, it has to be enjoyable, but it's, it's a family down here. Um, and I'm sure it's the same in every other base in the country as well. Shifts come to an end, days come to an end, sometimes people's lives come to an end, all good things come to an end, but when the next shift starts, somebody else is there and it'll all begin again. I'd probably love to become a paramedic, ultimately, um, and watch this space, I suppose. <laughs>